Okay. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started then. <laughs> I thought we had a video there, but uh, all right. Well, welcome to week two of this series we're calling Trauma. And man, we got off to a great start last weekend, and I hope you've seen it. If not, uh, you can go online to our website, thejourneywith.us. You can watch that interview that I did with April Bordeaux, uh, who uh, works with Care to Change Counseling. And uh, it was just a great conversation. I've heard lots of good feedback from it, and uh, I hope that you were blessed by it. Uh, throughout the next three Sundays, I want to let you know, uh, I mentioned it last week, but I want to let you know that we will be uh, having a panel with us in just a few weeks that will answer your questions. And so over the next three weeks, you can text in your questions, which I think we have a slide for that. Is that correct, gentlemen? Yeah, there it is. So, uh, so you can text in your question, and then this panel of experts will answer it on Sunday, February the 7th. Uh, and so what you'll do is you'll text... Uh, Tim Parsons 532 to the phone number 22333. When you do that, you'll get a text back letting, your know, letting you know that you're in. Now, here's the only caveat to that. There are a limited amount of questions. Now, we can pay to add more if we need to, but don't do this unless you have a question to submit. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Because once you do that step, then it starts to limit us to a certain number. Okay, And so if you have questions, submit them, but if you don't have questions yet or don't have a question at all, please don't follow those steps. But I want to encourage you, if you have questions, please text them in. We'll have a panel. I, I, think, that, I think Care to Change is bringing six or seven people, uh, and they're all um, subject matter experts in different subjects. So some of them work with youth, for example. That, if you have questions about your kids and maybe some trauma in their life or some suspected trauma they have, or uh, we, have, we have counselors that will be coming that specialize in marriage. And, and so if you have questions about your marriage, and all of this will be anonymous. Nobody will know who you are. So if you have those tough questions that you're wanting to submit, please text the, them in. But we'd love to be able to have this panel answer all of your questions. Does that make sense what I'm saying? And so even those of you that are watching online at home, man, text in your questions. Aaron, I hope you're leaving that number up there for just a few minutes. Uh, give people some time to jot that down. Uh, and maybe even Aaron throughout, maybe you're already playing on this, but maybe scroll it throughout. I know we didn't get to talk about that, but just different points. Maybe you want to drop that in uh, to remind people of the number if they have questions. But that's going to be a fun part of this, I think. And so I'd love to be able to answer those questions that you submit. Well, today... Today I get the privilege and the very difficult task of talking about the intersection of trauma and faith. The intersection of trauma and faith. And this is a big topic. This is a big topic mostly because the church has historically stayed away from subjects like this. And so to clearly and succinctly point out this intersection will be a journey for all of us, and I hope that I do it justice. One of the most compelling stories I've heard, it comes from a book called Good to Great. It's written by Jim Collins. Maybe you've read that. It's a business book, and it's one of my favorites. Uh, and uh, there's a story in there of a gentleman by the name of Admiral Jim Stockdale. You maybe have heard his story, but Jim Stockdale, Admiral Jim Stockdale, he was the highest ranking United States military officer to ever find himself in what was called Hanoi Hilton, prisoner of war camp. He was a POW during the height of the Vietnam War. Admiral Jim Stockdale, he was tortured over 20 times during his eight-year imprisonment. Can you imagine? Eight years as a POW. He was a POW from 1965 to 1973. And you see his time there, Stockdale, he, he lived out the war without any prisoner's rights, no set release date, and no certainty as to whether he would even survive to see his family again. And I think we would all agree that that is a significantly traumatic experience, isn't it? It's hard to even imagine. Admiral Stockdale was asked by the author of Good to Great, how'd you make it through? There were many who didn't make it through, but how did you make it through this quite traumatic experience? And his response was simple, yet profound. He says this, he says, I never, I never lost faith in the end of the story. I never lost faith in the end of the story. Church, isn't that the journey of the Christian faith? 
Isn't that the journey for all of us? Is that along our life, we are going to face tough things. We're going to face hard things. But one of the most important things for you and me is that we never lose faith in the end of the story. He continues, he explains, he says, I never doubted. I never doubted not only that I would get out, but also that I would prevail in the end and turn this experience into the defining event of my life, which in retrospect, I would not trade. Can you imagine it? Eight years of POW. Tortured. Hungry. Unsure of what the next day held. And yet he says, I wouldn't trade it. Jim Collins, in his famous way of of interviewing folks, he then turns the question over a little bit. And he said, well, what about those that didn't make it? How would you describe the people that, that didn't make it out like you? Who are they? How would you describe them? And he said, oh, that's easy. It was the optimists. It was the people that were overly optimistic. He describes this. He says the optimists, oh, they were the ones who said, we're going to be out by Christmas. And then Christmas would come and Christmas would go. And then they'd say, oh, we're going to be out by Easter. And then Easter would come and Easter would go. And then Thanksgiving and then it would be Christmas again. And he says they then died of a broken heart. Stockdale then goes on to say, this is a very important lesson. You must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they may be. You cannot confuse faith in the end with an absence of being real with yourself about what you're going through. What an interesting look into this extremely traumatic experience that many people never completely heal from. But I think what we see here in these words of Admiral Stockdale is an illustration of how all of us interact from a faith perspective, how all of us interact either in a healthy way or an unhealthy way with the trauma that we experience in our lives. And so in my time remaining with you this morning, I want to just simply rehearse a few observations that I've made over the years when talking and walking with people through traumatic experiences in their lives. Here's the first one. Write it down. Trauma exposes your theology. Trauma exposes your theology. When you and I are faced with suffering and confusion and chaos and pain, our very theology becomes exposed. In other words, what we truly believe about God bubbles to the surface and we easily find ourselves living our faith or the lack thereof, from our deep, or in many cases, shallow faith. And can I just say to you, far too many of us have a me-centered theology rather than a he-centered theology. Our theology seems to be centered around how I feel and how I'm blessed or how I'm persecuted or how I'm suffering rather than the truth of who he is in the midst of all of those things. And when that theology becomes exposed in our lives, we quickly find our faith wavering when we face things that don't line up with our view of God. Listen to me, church. We're talking about trauma. Can I just say to you boldly, God is never, God is never, God is never the cause of your trauma. God is never the cause of your trauma. Trauma happens in our lives because we live in a fallen, sinful world. People are the cause of your trauma. And we should never somehow find ourselves at a place where we imagine that God caused the pain that I feel. 
Jesus even says it clearly. He says, because of the increase in wickedness. Everybody say increase. Because of the increase in wickedness, what happens? The love of many grow cold. We face trauma in our lives not because God causes it, but because people cause it. Because people are sinful, people are wicked, and people will do things to you. The pain and the hurt that we experience in this life is the result of a wicked, hate-filled world, everybody. But because we have a me-centered theology, when things happen to me that don't align, we begin to make decisions and take action on things that only make our situations worse. Rather than trusting God in the middle of our pain, we find ways to medicate or numb the pain. Rather than believing Scripture when it tells us that suffering is a part of this life, rather than trusting Scripture when we face suffering, we pursue things that make us feel happy, even if just for a moment. When we face trauma in our life, it exposes our theology. Bad theology, bad theology says that good things happen to good people and bad things only happen to bad people. Maybe you've said that yourself or you've heard somebody say that. Why are we surprised when bad things happen to us? Because we have bad theology. We have me-centered theology. Why is this happening to me? So-and-so over here, they do this and they do that, and they don't ever go through stuff like this. Why am I going through stuff like this? I mean, I read my Bible. I go to church. I'm raising my kids right. I even tithe, God. This shouldn't be happening to me. I'm a good person. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but listen. I know that thinking all too well because I've been there. And what's interesting to me about that line of thinking is how quickly we are to label ourselves and those few in our close circles as good. Don't we imagine all too easily that we are the good person in our story? I do good things, so I'm somehow exempt from pain and suffering and trauma. Oh, are you really? Are you really a good person? I mean, maybe in a comparative sense to somebody else. Maybe when I compare myself to someone that I really don't know, or someone that I see on the news has done a really bad thing, then maybe I think I'm a good person, but really... Am I really good? It's a challenging question, isn't it? But here's the truth for today. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Whether I'm good, whether you're good, whether they're good or bad, it really doesn't matter. When it comes to pain and trauma, whether you're good or bad, it doesn't matter. Good theology reminds us that good and bad things happen to good and bad people. And I would even submit disproportionately. We love one-to-one equations, don't we? One plus one equals two. Listen, when it comes to pain and trauma and suffering, it is anything but a one plus one equals two. How's that for an encouraging message? But the Bible's clear, isn't it? John 16, 33, it says there, I've told you these things so that in me you have peace. Guess what? In this world, you're going to have trauma. In this world, you're going to have pain. In this world, you're going to have problems and trouble. But take heart. I've overcome the world. Isn't that good news today, church? Not only, this is not good news, but not only do bad things happen to good people and bad people, But it happens in a disproportionate way. In other words, more bad things can happen to a good person than bad things happen to a bad person. But pastor, that's not fair. It's not. And I'm sorry that it's not fair. But it's good theology. And listen to me, church. We end up causing ourselves more and more pain when we hold on to bad theology. If we think for even a moment that the pain in our lives was caused by God, we 
or somehow that the life we experience is out of alignment with what the Christian life is supposed to be, we are living from a place of very bad theology. And can I just go a little bit further and say very dangerous theology? My encouragement to all of us is to have a healthy view of our theology, a healthy view of God, especially as it relates to suffering and pain in this world. Church, I'm very sorry. But in this world, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have pain. You're going to have suffering. You and me, we're going to have trauma. But Jesus is our source of hope. Not at the expense of being honest with ourselves about the pain and confronting those brutal facts about what we're going through. Not at the expense of even getting help from places like Care to Change Counseling. But Jesus is our hope, especially in the middle of life's most difficult circumstances. Trauma exposes our theology, doesn't it? Here's observation number two. Write it down. Trauma gives us the choice. Either be bitter or get better. Either get better or get bitter. Again, Jeff, I don't know if you can put this slide back up. The last slide, I think it was, there from Admiral Stockdale, said there, it's a very important lesson. You can't confuse faith that you'll prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts in your current reality. Our faith, church, does not mean that we ignore the facts of what has happened to us or what is happening in us. Hope is this focus on the future, but it is not a denial of the present. I tell people all the time, the first step in healing is to be honest with yourself that what you've been through is really hard. I find that people come to me often and they just want to jump to the solution. But if you haven't stopped or paused to fully recognize and receive and maybe even grieve that what you're going through is really hard, then you'll never get to healing. We put on our masks and we tell everyone, ah, I'm doing okay. All the while, growing more and more bitter on the inside. If you and I want to truly get healthy and heal from what hurt us, we've got to start being honest with ourselves about the brutality of what has happened to us. Instead, when we face traumatic experiences, we find ourselves not only hurting ourselves from the pain and the trauma, but also bitter and angry at people and circumstances around us that never caused the hurt. In other words, when we refuse to get better, Bitterness will rob our lives of anything significant. Our relationships will lack significance because we're bitter. Our days will lack significance because we're wrapped up in our bitterness and we deny that we even need help. We go through the motions of life because bitterness has taken root in our heart and we wonder somehow why the days blur together and we lack any kind of purpose or direction. There's this compelling story in the life of the Apostle Paul. The story where he is a prisoner and he is shipwrecked on an island. And Paul, in this moment in Acts chapter 28, he faces this new kind of trauma. Now, Paul, I would submit to you, was traumatized time after time throughout his life. He also did some traumatic things to people too, right? You got what coming to you there, Paul? We'll talk about that in a minute, actually. Let's pick up the story in Acts chapter 28, verse 1. It says there, once we were safe on shore, we learned that we were on the island of Malta. The people of the island were very kind to us. It was cold and rainy, and so they built a fire on the shore to welcome us. Paul, in famous fashion, he doesn't just want to be an onlooker. He wants to pitch in and help. And so as Paul gathered an armful of sticks and was laying them on the fire, a poisonous snake, snake driven out by the heat, bit him on the hand. Now, I just want to stop right there for just a minute. He was bitten on the hand by a snake. 
Paul was going about his life. See if this ministers to anybody in here. You're just going about your life. You're even trying to help some people. You're trying to do the right thing. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, this snake pops out and bites you. Something traumatic happens to you. Some pain that you thought you were over rears its ugly head. There's this snake in your life that came out of nowhere and just bit your hand. And the snake, the snake here, it doesn't just bite his hand and then go away. No, no, no. This snake bites and holds on for dear life. Here's the question of the trauma series for all of you. What is your snake? What is that thing in your life that you've been bitten by? What's that snake in your life that you just haven't quite healed from? What is that snake right now in your life that's holding on for dear life? The snake, it bit a hold of his hand. And how many know a snake bite is a traumatic experience? I hate snakes. Anybody with me? Like the scene from uh, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? Indiana Jones, one of those. And he falls into the pit of snakes, right? Anybody remember that scene? Like, that's my worst nightmare. And I, I think it's biblical, right? Back to Genesis, the snakes are not good. But this snake bites a hold. Anybody ever been bitten by a snake? Yeah. It, it, it didn't tickle, right? No, it probably hurt a little bit, right? So you can imagine in this moment that Paul, as he thinks he's just going about life, trying to be helpful, all of a sudden, out of the blue, this snake bites him, and I bet it hurt. The story continues. The people of the island saw it hanging from his hand. And they said to one another, a murderer, no doubt. Though he escaped the sea, justice will not permit him to live. Oh, come on, somebody. The people started talking. Mm -mm -mm. Anyone ever go through something, maybe something traumatic, and you have people start talking about you? Ooh, girl, did you see what happened to Tim? I wonder what he did to make that happen. He deserved it. I roll. He thought he was going to get away with it, but look, look, look. Hear me out, church. People will talk about you. People will talk about you. When you and I are dealing with the pain and the trauma in our lives and we're trying to get better rather than bitter, trust me, people will come along and try to mess that up. Guess what Paul does? He shook it off. Paul shook off the snake into the fire and was unharmed. Some of you, some of you started singing there. I, I heard you. Shake it off. <laughs> Paul shook off the snake into the fire and he was unharmed. Now listen, this word unharmed can be a little misleading to me and you, can it? I mean, it doesn't really define what unharmed means. But the translation here, I will admit, is tricky. But basically, the words translated here unharmed means that something, get this, something happened to Paul other than what you would naturally think. Something happened in this moment opposite, come on somebody, opposite than what should have. So it's not that the bite didn't hurt Paul. It's that the poison didn't go in. Come on somebody. The poison of bitterness did not enter in. And for you and for me, we are faced. Every time trauma comes into our life, it doesn't mean we're not going to get hurt, but it does mean that we have a choice to either get better from it or to get bitter because of it. And then the story continues with Paul. I love this story. Go back and read it. The people waited for him to swell up and suddenly drop dead. Again, people will watch you. People will see the trauma you face and they'll just wait. I've had some people waiting on me for a long time, but here I stand. But when they had waited a long time and saw that he wasn't harmed, they changed their minds and they decided he was a God. Again, tricky here, right? 
I'm not saying go through trauma so people will think you're a god. <laughs> Just to be clear. But what, what, what I think it's saying here is they're, they're acknowledging that God is at work. They acknowledge that God had a hand in this somehow. They're acknowledging that that ain't natural, that's supernatural. And can I just tell you, choosing to not get bitter and to get better sometimes takes the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And listen to me, people, people, people be peopling. People can be a vessel for healing or they can bring you more pain. And when we're trying to get better rather than bitter, be careful who you're listening to. I believe that in the same way that God can send people, like the folks that care to change into our lives to help us find healing, our very real enemy can send people into our lives that will try to discourage us, define us, and doubt us. And let me just speak into your life for just a minute, church. God did not cause the trauma in your life, but he can use it to bring healing to others. I heard another preacher talk about this, so I can't take any level of credit for this, but it's good, and it's right in Scripture. You see, we don't have these verses for the screens, but if you read the rest of the story, uh, there's this, this moment right after this, shaking off the snake and everybody watching, where Paul is invited to a meal. And it's this meal with the chief official in the island. And he comes to learn that this chief official's father is actually ill. And so Paul, he goes and he lays hands on the father, and he's healed. And then other sick people come, and Paul lays his hands on them, and they're healed. You at home, well, Sam, come up here for a second. Let's get this on the camera just so people can see it. It's my son Samuel. Can you guys all thank him for helping me with this illustration? Paul comes, and he lays hands on him, and the father's healed. Paul comes, and he lays hands on others, and they're healed. What just a few minutes ago had a snake in it is now being used for healing. Somebody get this today. The hand that was bitten by the snake is now the hand that God is using to bring healing to others. So you don't think your story can be used? You don't think your trauma can be used to help others? God can use your trauma to heal others. Thank you, buddy. Get better instead of get bitter and watch what God will do through your hurt and pain. Here's my third and final observation. Trauma is an opportunity every single time to either run to God or to run away from God. Trauma is an opportunity to run to God or away from God. You've heard me say this one many times before, church, but it, it bears reminding. Every time you face pain and suffering and hurt in your life, you can choose. I'm either going to run to God or I'm going to run away from God. And let me be clear in this one. Asking God questions or even questioning God is not running away from God. In fact, I'd submit to you it shows a faith in God. After all, why would you ask questions of someone you don't believe in. Asking questions is not running away from God. Stay. Ask your questions. When things get hard, ask the tough questions. But don't you dare run away from God. One scripture from Psalm, there's many of them, but one scripture from Psalm that ministers to me deeply, especially when I'm hurting, is this one from 56.8. Record my misery. List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? Church, listen to me. God sees you in the middle of your pain. God is hurting when you're hurting. God is not somehow negligent or absent when you're going through trauma. He is near. Scripture says that he's near to the brokenhearted. God says to cast your cares on him because he cares for you. In the Old Testament book of the prophet Isaiah, we see a picture of where God, God is distressed as his people are distressed. That is the picture of the God that we call Father. God is not absent from your situation. He is right in the middle of it with you. And it's curious to me how quickly 
People give up on God when they face hard things. We saw it throughout this pandemic. I have seen it time and time again. When a person goes through something hard, they keep God at arm's length. They stop praying. They stop spending time with Him. They stop reading His Word. They stop going to church. They stop attending their small group. And if they don't distance themselves from God, they distance themselves from God's people. And I believe that God puts the people in your life that are there for your benefit, for your healing, for your encouragement, for your blessing. Hear this. Trauma is an opportunity every single time to either run to God or run away from God. And the choice is 100% yours. God is there. God cares. And God wants you to heal from what hurt you. And what I've personally found is that healing is a both-and endeavor rather than an either-or one. We can easily imagine that all we need is Jesus and that is enough. But what happens is when we say that to ourselves, all we're really saying is that I'm not going to pursue any other help. I'm not going to talk to my pastor. I'm not going to talk to my doctor. And I certainly am not going to talk to a counselor. Listen to me. It's not either-or here, guys. It's not either you pursue Jesus for healing or you go to a counselor for healing. You can pursue Jesus while at the same time go to counseling. And you can even believe that God sent that counselor into your life to help you heal. I love this illustration. I've used it many times. You've probably heard it many times, but it's so appropriate I could not use it. A certain man was drowning. And he finds himself having no fear. Why? Well, this man that's drowning, he's very religious. God will save me, he says. A man in a canoe rolls by, offers the man, a, the drowning man, a life jacket. And he says, No thanks, my God will save me. Then a helicopter comes overhead and the crew throws down a ladder to help save the drowning man. But again, the drowning man says, no, 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 thanks. My God will save me. Finally, a person swims out to the drowning man to save him. And the man says, climb on my back. I'll swim you to shore. Of course, the drowning man, he still refuses. He says, no, thanks. My God will save me. So the man returns back to shore. Sadly, this drowning man did drown. And he goes to heaven where he sees God, and he says to God, God, I prayed every day. I was a very religious man. I did everything. I prayed, and I went to church, and I did everything I was supposed to do. So I've got to ask you, why in the world did you let me drown? Why didn't you save me? And God replies famously, I sent you a canoe a helicopter, and a man to bring you to shore, and you refuse the help. And for some of us, God is saying right now, I'm sending help, and you're missing it. This series is meant to help you, everybody. Receive it. Adjust your theology, refuse to get bitter, and run to God rather than away from Him. Help is here if you'll see it and receive it. Care to Change, who we're going to hear from over the next three weeks. Next week will be about the, how trauma impacts relationships around us. Listen to me. If you have relationships, be here next week. That means everybody. I hope. If you don't have relationships, come talk to me. And then the next week will be about healing. How can we find true healing from our trauma in our lives? And then, like I said, that third week will be a panel. Will they answer your questions? Hopefully, you've submitted some questions today. Help is here if you'll see it and receive it. I personally believe that care to change has been sent here by God. So please do not miss it. Get the help you need. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for who you are. I thank you, Lord, that you do not leave us, you do not forsake us. That, Lord, especially when we find ourselves at the deepest points of our need, that we can turn to you, that we can lean into you, that we can run to you and find help. 
And God, I, I thank you, Lord, that you open our eyes regularly to the help that is around us. Help us to see it, Lord. Help us to see those canoe boats and helicopters and those people swimming toward us to save us. Lord, I pray that none of us would turn them away out of our own religious uh, bent or just out of our own pride, God. I pray that we'd find help, that we'd receive help. Because on the other side of that, I believe that there's healing, there's purpose, and Lord, there's a testimony that couldn't be created any other way. And so, Lord, we thank you for speaking to us clearly today. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand to your feet and let's worship him together. Here is where I lay it down Every burden, every crown This is my surrender And this is my surrender And here is where I lay it down Every lie and every doubt This is my surrender And I will make room for you To do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to, and I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. And here is where I. This is my surrender, this is my surrender, and here is where I lay it down, every lie and every doubt, this is my surrender, and I will make room for you. To do whatever you want to And I will make room for you To do whatever you want to To do whatever you want to Jesus Shake up the ground of all my tradition Break down the walls of all my religion Your way is better And your way is better And shake up the ground of all my tradition Break down the walls of all my religion Your way is better And your way is better and shake up the ground of all my tradition Break down the walls of all my religion Your way is better, God And your way is better and Shake up the ground of all my tradition Break down the walls of all my religion Your way is better Your way is better and I will make room for you To do whatever you want to To do whatever you want to And I will make room for you For you To do whatever you want to To do whatever
Father, it's my prayer this morning that as we go from this place, that somehow a seed of what we've heard or experienced today would be planted in our hearts. That God, that today wouldn't just be another Sunday, but Lord, it would truly be a step in the direction of healing and freedom for our lives. And although I'm sure that looks different for each of us, I pray that God, we would find ourselves reflecting prayerfully and listening for your voice to guide us. And so Lord, I pray that you would show up in the midst of our pain and our hurt. That God, that you might help us to see clearly what it is you're doing and what step might be right for us. So Lord, we do surrender ourselves. We submit ourselves fully to you. God, I pray you'd remove the stuff in us that says we can't get help or we shouldn't get help. But Lord, help us to be so in love with you that we can't help but to want to be the healthiest version of us so that we might serve you more, impact your kingdom better, and just live the life you've called us to. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And now the blessing, if you'll receive it this morning, church. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace as you take steps towards healing. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you all. Have a great week. Proud for my tradition, break down.